So I wasn't planning on making this video for a few months, but my AI agent costs have gotten so out of control that I had no choice but to drop everything and solve this immediately. I got hit with a $40 bill in the last two weeks when I calculated it would cost $3. And that's only with 20 people using it pretty lightly. So we're talking about a cost that was 10 times higher than anticipated. And if it continues and I get more users, I would probably go bankrupt. If you're new here, welcome to the channel. My name is Chris and I build productivity apps. This is actually the third video in my series about building a custom AI agent from scratch. This video is about how I reduce the cost by about 80%. We're going to go a little bit deeper in this video, and instead of just showing you the solution, I'll actually show you how I architected the solution using Claude Code as a research assistant, and I'll walk you guys through the code so you can see what this looks like in practice. If you haven't seen the other two videos, definitely go check those out. I did a little bit of cost optimization in the last one, but to be honest, I wasn't too concerned with it, and I was more focused on making sure that it was actually useful. So I kind of pushed cost optimization off because I knew I could deal with it later. But after seeing this bill and realizing how badly I miscalculated things, I think that time is now. Okay, so let me tell you what went wrong. Wrong. During development, I had calculated that the cost would be about two to four cents per user, which was technically correct, but there was a massive oversight. I did not factor in that tool calls actually counted as a request too. So when a user asks, move my meeting to tomorrow, here's what actually happens. There's an initial request to understand the query. A tool is called to fetch the task data. A tool is called to update the event. In some cases, another tool is called to confirm with the user. And then there's a final response back to the user. So what I thought would be one request actually ended up being four to five. And this was happening with every single user request. So it made total sense why my cost would end up being 10 times higher. So I spent some time trying to figure out what was going on and it looked like the number one reason was I'm using GPT-40 as the model for almost every single call. And this is a very expensive model. Here's a chart comparing some of the popular models. And as you can see, GPT-40 is one of the most expensive. During testing, I did try to use cheaper models like GPT-40 Mini and Gemini Flash, but they just kept failing. They'd mess up time zones, they'd call the wrong tools, and sometimes they just completely misunderstood the user request. From my testing, most of the models were failing about 20% of the time, while GPT-4 was failing about 2% of the time. So I thought I had no choice but to use this expensive model. But then I realized something. Maybe these smaller, cheaper models aren't bad. Maybe I'm just asking them to do too much. Imagine if you're asking someone to house sit for you. You give them this massive list, like here's Luna's medication, take out the trash, here's how the thermostat works, here's how the dishwasher works. Imagine there's 100 items on this list. Even if they have the list right in front of them, there is a chance that when it's time to go walk Luna, and they're like, what time was I supposed to walk Luna? They still have to scan through this list and there's a chance that they might accidentally miss it. Now imagine if that list was smaller and there's only three tasks on that list. Now there's a way higher chance that they would execute those things more reliably. And from my experience, I think AI models operate the same way. The more tools and instructions you give it, the harder it is for it to reliably execute them, especially the smaller models. And to be honest, the solution is pretty simple at a high level. It's to dynamically generate a system prompt and a tool list rather than sending in a giant system prompt and all 17 tools. If you only send it exactly what it needs to do its job, the smaller models have a way higher chance of actually executing the request. With that solution in mind, I think it's more interesting if I actually just show you guys how I came up with the technical architecture using Claude Code. Before we jump into it, I am very excited to say a huge thank you to Anthropic for actually sponsoring this video. If you've been following my channel, you know that I'm a big advocate of Claude Code and I'd be using them even if they weren't sponsoring. So if you want to check out Claude Code, which is the tool I use to do the research and to actually implement the code, I will leave a link in the description. But this is something that I haven't seen a lot of people talk about and that's using Claude Code as a research partner and to help you architect out a technical solution. So let me show you guys how I did that and then we'll go into the implementations. What I'm gonna do is I actually use Claude Code inside of Cursor. So I open up my terminal on the right side and then I just type in Claude. And this is actually how you run Claude code. So what I did in my case was I asked it, can you analyze this code base and come up with a technical solution for me that will reduce the system prompt the tool calling and allow us to use way cheaper models. Please ultra think. And the reason I do the ultra think is if you didn't know, it's a special keyword that actually gets Claude code to think a little bit harder. So I'm gonna ask it to do this and it's gonna think for a pretty long time. And this is something I actually don't see a lot of people talking about is using Claude code as a research assistant to bounce ideas off of and just as a sanity check sometimes. Gonna ask it, hey, what do you think of this strategy? Is there something I'm not thinking about? I do this all the time when I'm thinking about architecting solutions. I do it to double check security. I do it to double check efficiency. There's a lot of ways you can do this, but in this case, I'm using it to figure out what is the best strategy to get the context down so I can use these cheaper models? It actually shows it's thinking in real time and I actually really like that it's catching some of this stuff. It identified that the system prompt is really massive. I am using very expensive models like 4.0 and Claude Sonnet, that there's 17 tools. I just finished and it came up with this. I'm gonna ask it, can you put this in a markdown file so I can review? 
I just don't want to read it in here. Okay, so it came up with these two documents. So I'm going to show you guys what it did. It did a pricing comparison for some of the different models, which is really great. And it actually recommend using 4.0, Gemini 2.0 Flash, DeepSeek. I'm going to double check some of these costs and models. And we might use different ones, but really cool that it did the research and got the pricing. It recommend to do some smart model selection and classify it according to complexity. And then we'll go to the other file here. And here's the architecture that it's proposing. So it says to use an intent classification layer using Gemini Flash, which will be very, very cheap. It gave us some intent types, like whether this is a search operation, if you're gonna do an analysis. Here's the architecture for building a dynamic system prompt. So it's to break things down into these modules. So instead of having one giant system prompt, you have a bunch of modules and depending on what the intent is, we're gonna take different models, piece them together and build a dynamic system prompt. It's gonna reduce it from 25,000 tokens to about two to 5,000, which is a huge reduction. Same thing for the dynamic tool calling. We're going to break these up into different groups and then depending on what the intent or what the user is asking, we will pull different tools. So we don't send all 17 anymore. We're just gonna send a couple and this will reduce it by about 50 to 70%. So it wants us to actually choose the specific model depending on how complex the request is. So we have ultra budget models like Gemini Flash and then premium models like 4.0, which are only to be used when absolutely needed when we think this is a very complex request. It came up with this analysis. It shows the implementation details. So we're gonna have one orchestrate request function and it looks like we're gonna classify the intent. We're gonna build that dynamic system prompt and tooling and then select the model and then return all of it. It has a couple more thoughts here, but this is a really good game plan. This is actually how I usually start a lot of complex architecture. I have Cloud Code come up with it, and at minimum, this is a really good starting point, even if I don't fully use it. So that's a tip for you guys. It's to use Cloud Code as a research partner when you're coming up with this architecture. So once I had this technical architecture, the next thing I did was I just asked Cloud Code to go ahead and implement it. And I know it sounds crazy, but it actually did implement this in one shot. And I think it's because the plan was so well laid out, it knew exactly what to execute. So let me show you guys what this dynamic system prompt and tool system looks like in case you want to implement it in your own apps. Let me walk you guys through the implementation of this. I promise it's actually not that bad. We now have this new function that we passed every single request into. So the first thing we do is we classify what kind of request the user's message is. So is it a complicated one? Is it a time boxing one? Once we have that, then we can go build this dynamic system prompt. Then we can select what tools we need to call. And then we select what model are we going to use for the agent. So all three of these things are gonna happen right after we classify what kind of message is the user sending here. So let's go jump into it. Let's first look at this intent classification. So this is that smaller model I'm talking about that takes the user's request and figures out what kind of request is this? What model should we be using? What tool should we be calling? Like this is the main thing that determines that. We're taking in the user's request and then we're basically trying to figure out what kind of message is this? Is this a complex scheduling thing? Is this an analysis question? And then we're just figuring out what complexity it is, what kind of tools we need, what kind of model do we think we're gonna need here. After we've analyzed the user's request, we're going to send in this object, which those other three functions are then going to use. And here's the instructions that I gave it to help it classify the user intent. So we're gonna send this off to the smaller, cheaper model, which in this case is Gemini 2.0 Flash, and then it's gonna respond with this object. So now we have all of this metadata of what kind of request this is, what models we're gonna be needing, what tools we're gonna be needing. And now we're actually gonna use it to build the system prompt, to select the tools and to select the main model we're gonna use. For building the system prompt, it's very simple. First, what we're gonna do is we're gonna send in things that are kind of non-negotiable depending. So this is like data information. This is whether we need to confirm things with the user. These are just non-negotiables. And then here's how we're actually building the system prompt. So what I did was I took my massive system prompt that I had before and I broke it up into modules. And depending on what kind of modules are needed for the request, we're only gonna send those in. So for example, I have a module for deletion stuff, for scheduling stuff, for time zone stuff. We're basically picking from this list of modules and we're combining them all to make our really nice smaller system prompt. So that's what's going on here. Based on the intent, we're just gonna dynamically build the system prompt from these modules. Selecting the tools is kind of the same way. Based on the intent and the type of request, I also have a list of all the different tools. If it's a basic search operation, I'm just gonna give it all the search tools. If it's a scheduling operation, I'm gonna give it all of these tools. And if it's a combo of both, so if it's we require searching and scheduling, it's gonna be feeding in both. But that's basically what this select tools is calling. It's just pulling from this list of almost tool categories and it's just building out what tools are we gonna to need 
to meet this user's request. So these are the two big ones. It's building the system prompt and selecting the tools. And then the last one is actually selecting which model we're gonna be using. And this one's pretty simple. We're just mapping. If it's a very simple request, we're going to be using Gemini 2.0 Flash. If it's a very premium request, that's gonna need a very expensive model. We're gonna be using 4.0. Just ignore the fact that this is an array, by the way. I'm actually just using the first value in the array. I just set this up right now because I do plan on allowing for fallbacks in case, let's say, GPT-40 is down. Then what's gonna happen is it's gonna move on to the next model as a fallback. I have not implemented that yet, but I'm prepping for that, so that's why it's in an array right now. And so that's how we're selecting the model. And once all of this is combined and we have the tools, we have the models, we have the dynamic prompt, we're gonna send all of this to the LLM, but the result is that that context is now substantially smaller. We're talking like 80% smaller. And because of that, the smaller, cheaper models are gonna have a way easier time understanding and actually following the instruction. So I know this looks complicated, but I promise this is a really simple system. And yes, I actually had Claude Code implement all of this one shot. Obviously I reviewed it, but I really like the way that it did it here. So what happened after implementing these changes? The cost actually dropped from about two to four cents per request, which after tool calling ended up being about like 20 cents per request down to less than half a cent per request. And most of the times even lower than that. On average, over an 80% cost reduction. Now the big question is, did switching to these cheaper models hurt accuracy at all? And in this case, the answer is no. And the way I tested this was by building out an evaluation system, basically automated tests that run a bunch of scenarios that make sure that the agent is running properly. The reliability did not decrease because all of those tests ended up passing. And again, I think it's because now that each model has exactly what it needs and nothing more, there's just a higher chance that these smaller models can actually follow the instructions properly. I won't go in depth on this evaluation suite, but honestly, it could be a really good video. So if you want to see that, please comment below and I can make another video. The key takeaway here is that this dynamic system prompt and tool calling method is a very good alternative if you have a massive system prompt that you think that a model would not be able to follow properly. If you do this, you can get away using much cheaper models. Second thing is I was a little bit worried about using two to three smaller cheaper models versus using one more expensive model because of potential speed and cost concerns. But in reality, actually using two to three cheaper smaller models could be more efficient and cheaper than using one large one. And that's what happened in this case. And the third is if you're dealing with tool calling with agents, make sure to factor that into the cost. The funny thing is I'm really glad that this happened because it pushed me to learn some of these new techniques, which seem very obvious in hindsight. I'm sure I'm gonna be learning more optimization techniques as I go, so definitely expect more videos. But if you like this content, check out my Instagram and TikTok. I post almost every other day about building productivity apps. And obviously if you like this content, don't forget to subscribe. But thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.